Welcome to ForensicWeek.com. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland, CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and pr professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. This is episode 20. Today's topic for discussion is animal and agricultural forensic services as it relates to suspicious animal deaths, production of abnormalities, and injuries. This is obviously a major concern in our country's farmlands like Iowa, where our guest today uh, comes from. Viewers, ForensicWeek.com is a talk show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists, and we certainly have just that for you tonight. Presented live on your desktop every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. East, uh, Eastern Standard Time, right here on www.forensicweek.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows recorded and broadcast live using Google+, a social network service. Besides our special topic and guest, we broadcast our Forensic IQ Update Report, presented live by one of my student interns from the University of Maryland, who will keep you up on current issues, events, training that are important in the forensic community. Forensic interns working on the show this semester are Tim Fromm, producer of ForensicWeek.com, and Mark Lombard, Forensic IQ Update Reporter. Before I begin, like always, I'd like you, uh, you to hear a message from Tim, our producer, to tell you how to communicate with us while the show is going on and afterwards. Tim? Thanks, Tom. Um, as always, if you have any general questions about the show or an idea for a show, uh, you can email us here at forensicweek at gmail.com, and we'll get back to you or discuss it on a later show. If you're watching the show live right now and you have a question for our guest and you want it answered, while the show's going on, you can comment right on YouTube. I can bring it up on here, and we'll discuss it live on the show. Also, you should go to Facebook and search for the ForensicWeek.com show, as seen here. Like it and share it, and uh, get it to all your friends. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Tim. You know, for the last eight days, I've been on the road. Uh, first, last uh, last Friday, um, I no, excuse me, last Monday, um, I was in. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama, speaking to a group of industrial security uh, specialists uh, that work on DOD contracts about um, uh, various aspects of, of security and counterintelligence. And this past week, I was in Los Angeles, Oxnard, California, which happens to be where I was on 9-11. Same group of people. Interesting, the night before I'm speaking, there was another uh, uh, terrorist attack uh, that we all know about in Boston. Uh, but uh, because I was not in town, I asked Tim and Mark if they would take over the show. And if you uh, happened to be listening last Thursday, uh, Tim was the, the host of the show, and Mark Lombard and also Andrea Williams, another intern of mine, uh, handled the show. And what, the reason why I wanted them to do that is because, um, I want, first of all, I want to congratulate Tim and Mark and also Andrea. Uh, they were the team that competed up at Saint Mir uh, Mount St. Mary's University uh, on uh, April 6th. Uh, this was the first time that we were invited and, and participated. This was their ninth CSI Challenge event. They had 12 um, mock crime scenes, and 35 teams went through those crime scenes uh, and had to ensure that they that they did it using all the protocols and standards that uh, have been established by national uh, um, national guidelines, and uh, they ended up in third place, which was truly um, a remarkable um, feat because, again, it was the first time. We didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what to expect, and they did a great job. So uh, to Tim and Mark and Andrea, great job. Congratulations. And uh, what they did last Thursday is they, they talked with a number of the students, uh, the, in fact, the first place team was on there together with a couple of the students, uh, Leah and Madeline, who uh, were part of the sponsors from the Criminal Justice Student Association out there that uh, sponsored the event uh, and talked a little bit about what they did, what they experienced, what they learned, and uh, that was great. So, um, Tim, Mark, thank you very much. Great show. And, uh, and I know a lot of people were interested in it because we, we've been getting a lot of hits. Ladies and gentlemen, last week, um, another terrorist attack in Boston, my hometown. Um, you know, what can be said about that? Uh, 
uh, tragic event, uh, uh, something that I hate to say that uh, we in the intelligence community, at least uh, well, certainly the one I just retired from, are always uh, realizing uh, uh, can be a reality. Uh, those of you who may not know and haven't been watching TV, the FBI just put out a, a photograph, a surveillance photograph from cameras out in the street of two people that they believe um, um, uh, may be involved. In fact, Tim is putting that up right now. So if you haven't seen, if you're seeing it for the first time, I strongly suggest that, uh, especially if you're up in the uh, uh, the New England area and Boston area, uh, take a close look at that. Uh, I think they're going to be pretty close to uh, uh, finding a, finding a suspect. Uh, they're working very hard with uh, it, um, uh, in that case, and hopefully um, they'll uh, bring it uh, bring those people to justice um, as soon as soon as they can. Uh, last week when I was in uh, Huntsville, I also met a Dr. Kwanda Stevenson. Dr. Stevenson um, is the assistant professor and program director of the criminal justice program at Athens State University in Athens, um, Alabama. Uh, had a wonderful conversation. Uh, they have a great uh, criminal justice program, uh, both a, a bachelor's uh, program in, in advanced uh, programs in the field of criminal justice. And uh, I invited her to be on the show, and uh, she uh, she said absolutely. So we're looking for a date, hopefully um, in the uh, in in May, where she'll come on. I told her to have some of her colleagues and maybe some of the students from Alabama, so we can see what's going on down there and um, the curriculum down there and what kinds of job the job market there. Because again, those of you who are students looking for jobs, like Tim, Tim's graduating next month. So if you're out there and you're looking for a, uh, somebody with a criminal justice uh, legal background who came in third in the CSI challenge, then Tim Fromm is right there. Don't worry about Mark. He's got another year. He hasn't <laughs> learned enough yet. Uh, but uh, anyways, um, we'll uh, hopefully have them uh, on real soon. Tonight we'll be discussing a forensic topic that may sound a bit unusual, animal and agricultural forensic services. Forensic science is an ever-growing field of study, and thanks to my membership in the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, I had the honor and pleasure to meet our guest, uh, a person who has dedicated his research and study in every conceivable form of investigation as it relates to um, uh, animal nutrition, in agriculture, etc. His name is Dr. Gary Pizzillo, uh, coming to us from Marshalltown, uh, Iowa. Gary, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome to Iowa. <laughs> your pitch is good, and we're, we're hearing you fine. Uh, Dr. Pizzillo is a, the owner and, and president of INTI Service Corporation, which which provides investigative, forensic, and expert witness services for claims and litigated cases involving animal deaths, production, abnormalities, and injuries. Uh, his PhD is in animal nutrition from, of course, Iowa State University. He's a former consultant and animal feed formulator for Disney's anim uh, Walt Disney's Animal Kingdom and Ringling Brothers Circus. Um, later on, Gary, you got to tell me what a animal feed formulator is, okay? Don't forget to do that. He's a consultant to major farms and animal nutrition and, and health companies. He did. Uh, he worked in. He spent 12 years in Brazil and uh, in Argentina providing veterinarian and in nutrition services. Uh, he develops priority animal forensic techniques and conducts forensic investigations in this area, accepted as an expert witness in federal courts to provide testimony on veterinarian and nutritional issues. And you're all, I'm sure you're still sitting saying, okay, I know what veterinarian is, I know what nutrition is, I know what animals are, but, and I know what forensic science is. How do we put this together? Well, let me tell you, in the past uh, February, uh, Dr. Bazillo received the American Academy of Forensic Sciences uh, General Section Achievement Award, uh, and he did that because uh, of presenting the techniques in, in the investigative uh, uh, activities that he has used to help uncover uh, information that has led to um, uh, criminal cases being solved. 
putting that all aside, my good friend Gary is also an ordained permanent deacon in the in the Roman Catholic Church, and he has been uh, um, since 2003. So this is a very busy man between his duties as a deacon, uh, the president of a, of a company, and, and a consultant. And he's not just working in Iowa. He's coming from Iowa on his, on his farm. But uh, Gary is asked to uh, provide his services throughout uh, the, 40, uh, the lower 48. So uh, it's our pleasure to have him here. And Gary, I want to start out. Um, with um, a question, uh, when we associate the word forensic to science, uh, that usually con uh, connotates some sort of a problem that exists. So why don't you define for us exactly the an uh, what animal agriculture forensic sciences uh, is or are and how you got involved in this and what are the issues? Well, that's a broad question. Um, let's start from the beginning. You know, we have so many different types of animal agriculture. We have pigs and chickens and dairy cattle, and some of these farms actually have millions of animals. So when we start seeing deaths in feed-producing animals, obviously the public is probably very concerned because it's going to be passed to their plate pretty soon um, from farm to fork. So when I get involved with these animal cases and a forensic basis, we have to reproduce what actually happened on these farms or trying to determine what's the actual causation uh, that's making these animals ill or their products tainted. Uh, for example, yeah, if we have... Gary, to, if, I could, if I could just stop you. Uh, at what point, I mean, if, if an animal dies on a farm, you know, uh, at what point does it become suspicious to where they want to call someone like you in? Well, for example, if we have, um, for ex in the past, I've had disgruntled employees of a, of a place that would put something into the feed that would cause major disruptions in the production or even or death of the animals. Um, so a simple altercation between employees and their boss can result in some problems associated with uh, animal deaths. So that's always in the back of my mind. Is there somebody on the farm that's disgruntled and causing these problems? Uh, so that's how I look at it. I, I look at if the people working there can be a suspect, are the people at the uh, mixing facilities for the feed that's being produced for this farm um, a suspect? So you kind of look at all the different parts just like you would Do, uh, do they call you or people like you first? Uh, can they, if they suspect something, can they call the police? Uh, uh, if you get called first um, and you conduct an investigation, at what point do you have to call law enforcement into the process? All right, so tell us a little bit about, first of all, let me just welcome Andrea Williams, another one of my interns. She's the third spoke of the uh, the CSI team. Welcome, uh, Andrea. Hi, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, okay, Gary, so um, what type of techniques are you using? Are they, they probably might be similar to conducting any type of a crime, is that correct?
Wait a minute. What kind of farm? Frogs? You're kidding. Why would we? Why do we have frog farms? <laughs> okay. You say, if you say it, I believe it. All right. Really? Okay. All right. All right. Go ahead, please. No. <laughs> <laughs> I to, uh, to my view to my viewers wait a minute to my viewers I told Gary at the beginning that he's got to tell me when he's joking and when he's not joking because I'm a city boy and uh, I believe almost anything okay <laughs> now so you actually have a case right now where there's three 300 plus dairy cows that are sick Mm. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I bet. Now you mentioned that you bring all your stuff. Obviously, your tools of the trade. What are what? Describe your stuff.
I, you know, I've been looking for a new module. I've been looking to add a new module to my course here at the University of Maryland. Maybe I need to do that. That would be a good uh, exercise. Uh, all right, that's true. Now you mentioned that you do uh, you, you do autopsies. Do you do the autopsies on the farm? Do you transport the bar uh, the body the uh, the whatever you the carcass or whatever you call it uh, uh, someplace else to have it done? <laughs> no, no, no. But but seriously, do you do an autopsy at the location? Who's who's pay, who's who's paying for that to be done? In the in the cases you've done, what percentage of them also the results were it was a natural event that caused the contamination versus an intentional event? How often is it intentionally done by a human being uh, causing that to happen? Yeah, well. Right. Right, right, right. Uh, so a lot of these cases, civil cases then, right? Yeah. Um, Mm-hmm. 
that, that now that's really interesting to me. Okay, um, the insurance fraud, and I never even thought of that. So okay, so you get up in the morning, you go in your barn, and your twenty-five thousand, fifty thousand dollar racehorse has got a broken leg, right? Um, and, and I guess they put down horses that got a broken leg, right? Well, okay, let's say they don't. So uh, if, in fact, that horse is insured, is there a requirement for the owner to notify the insurance company right away so the insurance company can decide whether they want to have someone like you come in and examine them? Is there a, is there a statutory requirement to call this this veterinarian who came in uh, is that person a government employee representing the uh, representing the government uh, um, or is it just the, the individual owner's uh, veterinarian And you, uh, how how long? Oh God, how long after that happened did you get involved in, to examine the horse? Okay, and. My goodness, my students. Any, any. Um, again, we uh, Gary and I can talk and talk and talk here. Do you have any specific questions? I find this to be interesting. This is a whole area of forensics. Even though I've known Gary for a couple of years and and I knew what he what he did based on titles and stuff, but now I'm really getting it. Uh, interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> questions from anybody? Um, just. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Was there like a surge in the in the uh, as crimes against horses? Like, did you see that that surge? And then once you got involved, did you see it kind of plateau out a little bit, or was there are there still a bunch of those sort of crimes?
My God. Let me just mention that we're talking to Dr. Uh, Gary Bazillo from Iowa, um, who is in, who is a forensic animal and agricultural um, scientist who examines and investigates um, the uh, uh, circumstances surrounding animal deaths, you know, whether it was an accident, whether it's a disease, or, or whether it was intentional. And he's bringing up some areas uh, that uh, certainly uh, – uh, are new to me. How many how many people are there out in the country like you, Gary, that provide the services that you provide? <laughs> no, you're not. You're getting you're getting better, Gary. You're getting better. <laughs> uh, well, so let me ask you, Gary, because again, one of the things this uh, forensicweek.com is about, you know, educating students on in the various areas of forensic science. If a student happened to be interested in criminal justice, but also was born and brought up on a farm and is interested in the animals. Uh, how would they get interested in doing the things that you've been doing most of your career? Uh, and I agree that creative and critical thinking both important. What should they? What um, what majors associate with college? You know, curriculum associate with uh, with the kind of study that they need to have to to be able to do what you do well. De dead pigs. You autopsied three hundred pigs. Okay. Is this case uh, finished yet? Okay. Okay, so we don't want to talk about it. Do you have uh, a couple of cases that are, are, are completed that you can tell us a little bit about? You know, you know what was the what was the issue? Um, what were the findings, the investigative techniques you used, and what were the results?
Uh, who, who is she blaming? Okay, who? Okay, but who is she? Who is she blaming again? Okay. Now, did did she did she contract with you for the investigation? <clears throat> oh, okay, okay, very good. All right. Uh, uh, so, uh, is a lot of your work w uh, with insurance companies then? Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, what I'm going to do is just stop for a moment, Gary, and I'm going to bring Gary, I mean, I'm sorry, Mark and Andrea. Andrea, I'm going to have you uh, talk a little bit about uh, one or two of the uh, items you have on the blog, uh, and then we'll come back, Gary, and, and kind of, uh, kind of, you know, wind up our discussion and um, in, in, in kind of give it some direction in, in reference to the, you know, the, the topic and and uh, where students can go to learn more about this. And again, um, you know, uh, University of Maryland, I don't know if you know much about their animal uh, science uh, department. I don't. I know they have a big animal science department, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if they get involved in any of this, but I do know that when I was a police officer on campus in the 70s, uh, they had a building where they did these animal autopsies. If, a, if an animal died anywhere in the state of Maryland, you could bring it to College Park campus, and the animal science department did an autopsy. I went by one day, and I saw four hoofs coming, uh, sticking out of a, a 55 gallon barrel. I said, those look like horse legs and hoofs, and that's exactly what they were. And I opened up the door, and there's a completely wide open body of a, of a horse and they were looking at so we'll talk uh, we'll we'll finish up on that yeah um, mark um, why don't we start with you and if um, if it's one of the uh, items that um, um, Andrea did let we'll have Andrea tell us a little bit about it uh, go yeah. ahead mark okay great yeah um, the one that I put up on there um, is about eyewitness statements for crimes. And uh, often eyewitness statements are accepted as fact without any other supporting evidence. Um, one such case up, up on the blog was that Miami cops arrested a man based solely on the uncooperated witness statement of one witness. And, I mean, they, they later released him. Uh, was he convicted? He was not convicted, but he was in jail for quite a while, and I mean, they solely they didn't have any physical evidence to support this this witness statement. All they had was the witness's statement. Did the witness uh, did the witness intentionally lie, or did the witness simply give a statement which they believed to be true? There was evidence that the witness had a prior conflict with the suspect that was arrested. Mm -hmm. um, and that was not really investigated before the arrest okay. took place. What so, state was that? Florida? State? Miami. Yeah. Miami, Miami Florida. Florida. Yeah. Okay. Okay, what else you got? Um, you can find out more about that on the blog mm -hmm. right there. And the other two are both from Andrea, so I can turn over the, the microphone to Andrea and have her uh, report on those. Let's hear you, Andrea. <laughs> okay, to start... Um, one of the new ones that I found was um, involving the forensic signs of arson. And the big thing right now is um, uh, new discoveries are freeing um, innocent convicts. Um, for one case, uh, uh, Lewis C. Taylor, he spent 42 years in prison um, being convicted of setting a, a hotel fire that killed 29 people. But the old practices that had originally convicted him are now showing to be faulty um, to show that now, some of the evidence that um, was in the uh, arson cases is now um, also shown up to be in accidental fires as well. Um, so there's been several cases actually where convicts are now being released who were originally innocent. Um, there was a, a modern fire investigator people interviewed, John uh, Lantini. He's looking at evidence that had originally convicted Taylor and several others, saying that it's now impossible to determine how some fires start just due to either the lack of evidence 
and um, certain evidence that they claim originally convicted some of these um, now innocent convicts are now being um, resolved as faulty. Um, and that can also be read in uh, full on the blog as well. And then the second one I found... Well, before, you, before you go to the second one, I just I want to let you know that University of Maryland has a fire science uh, department yep. on campus, and um, they have a, a whole faculty of people who, who, who teach arson investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a feeling that maybe it might be a good idea to see if we can get a couple of them uh, as guests, and we can talk more about that because, you know, uh, when I went to Arson uh, Investigation School, uh, they used to say that it's the absence of any evidence that shows it was uh, arson. You know, mm -hmm. it's the kind of the opposite of of homicide. All hom all unexpected deaths are, are soon to be homicide until proven otherwise. Um, so uh, it'd be interesting in that. Tell me the other one. Um, okay, so the other one I found uh, pretty heavily on a lot of different news sources, including a forensic magazine. It was actually done, discovered in Britain at the University of, forgive me for butchering this, Aberte, Dundee, um, and they've recovered latent fingerprints from foods, which has um, specifically fruits, which has been a pretty significant scientific breakthrough for them. Now, this isn't the first study to be done on this. Um, two other studies in India and um, in India and Slovenia have been done as well. But um, the big thing in Britain was they've used a different substance um, called. Uh, powder suspension PS that they use um, to help um, get the latent prints off of it. Um, the original ones that other people have used um, resulted low quality fingerprints that weren't acceptable for um, presentation in court, um, but the team at the University of Abertade Dundee um, found out that with this new substance they were able to find um, a lot high, higher quality marks on smooth surface foods such as like apples and onions and stuff. And this is just pretty significant because like it gives a lot um, law enforcement even more opportunities to find out evidence, you know, um, in terms of crime scenes. What if the food has been digested already and gone through the, the <laughs> process? Because uh, Dr. Bazzilli would really be interested in knowing about that technique, <laughs> wouldn't you, Gary? That one wasn't mentioned. Um, I'm <laughs> sure that if they see this, they're definitely going to have to try some tests on that. Um, but that wasn't mentioned, but I'm sure that as forensic science with this advances, um, that'll probably be one uh, coming up pretty soon. So that'll good be interesting to good see answer, how. Andrea. Good answer. <laughs> Anything else for either one of you? That's all I've got. Yeah, you got, a, got for that? Okay, Thank good. You. All of them right. can be found up on the blog. Yep. Address. Yes. I can't. Uh, uh, those of you who are trying to keep up with that, you know, uh, please go to the blog. Uh, the um, both of these students uh, spent a lot of time going through that stuff, writing uh, can, uh, um, short abstracts uh, to give you a sense of what the story is, and then they then all you have to do is click on um, the URL, and it'll bring you right to the entire story. So um, that's what these folks do, and. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, Andrea Williams will be graduating this, next month uh, like Tim. And uh, I understand uh, by, from listening to the show last week while I was at the airport that uh, you got accepted at the um, uh, Stevenson University and you, uh, and you are going there. So, one, yep. congratulations. Thank Two, you. I'm sure Professor Tobin, uh, who has been a guest on this uh um, show a, a numerous times who's a professor there will be very happy so he owes me another five bucks I get five dollars a head uh, so uh, that's really good all right let's get back to uh, thank you uh, Andrea and Mark uh, let's get back to Gary Gary okay we uh, we only have about ten minutes or so um, why don't you tell us uh, some of the things that you think are important that we haven't discussed because you if anybody knows this best it's you
Okay. <laughs> Not only is it a big barn, it's a big country, and you're telling me that there's two of you, and you're training a third that does this kind of work. So it appears to me that there's a lot of um, cases uh, that are going on uninvestigated that are, are being ignored are uh, people are assumed that that their accidents are natural when in fact they might uh, have other implications what 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 do you think needs to be done about that We're not losing you, are we, Gary? Okay, good. Okay. I mean, I don't want to have to give you last rights uh, via uh, Google+. Plus. <laughs> oh, I guess you can. Will it work? Is, it, is that legal? Yeah, that you can. I don't think that's legal. I remember when I was in... In, when I was in elementary school, the nuns told us that in an emergency situation, if somebody was dying and they hadn't been baptized, that you could actually baptize them. That's true. I baptized my sister about a thousand times that week. I remember I said, honey, I, I said to my sister, I'm going to baptize you because I found out that I can do that. I've got the, I got the power. Uh, I don't want to digress uh, there. But... You know, the, the, the thing is, students need jobs. Um, in, but so right now, uh, the states are not, are, are there any states who, who are recognizing that what you do is important uh, and, and, uh, and they should be establishing some type of mandated statutes that require certain things to be done? And... Um, you know, uh, governmental um, agencies uh, to do this. I know, again, you're private, so again, this is your company, uh, but are there any mandated requirements in any of the 50 states that you know of? <laughs> mhm. Mm Hmm. 
have you tried your, your members of uh, of those societies also have you made any attempt to try to cross over and, and, and bring them over like you did on your own I know I, I hear you I hear you very good all right before we leave I need to know what you said that you, um, in the past, you were a consultant in an animal feed formulator for Disney's Animal Kingdom in Ringland Brothers Bonham and Bailey Circus. What does that mean? Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You had what in your house? <laughs> Wait a minute. You got a tiger sleeping in your daughter's bed? <laughs> I know. <laughs> she slept with a tiger. She can deal with any case out there. What other exotic animals have you had in your house? Are they as pets, as do, have you, as domestic pets? Gary, you are an amazing man. You are truly an amazing man, and uh, it's been a really a real treat. I can't speak for the students, but it's been a real treat talking to you about, um, you know, the aspects of forensics in in this whole animal kingdom. You know, again, I said earlier, I'm a city boy, and you know, for me, when I lived, grew up, if I wanted to see a deer, I had to go to the zoo to see a deer. I mean, that's that's how that's where I lived uh, outside of Boston. Uh, but uh, let me just uh, say a few words before we close off, Gary. Um, next week, ladies and gentlemen, uh, will be episode uh, 21, and we will have a former New York City uh, police officer and police uh, detective sergeant, detective sergeant John Pialucci. Um, John is commanding officer for the uh, the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. He formed and commanded a unit that managed all the DNA evidence for a liaison unit between the police department um, and the medical examiner's office to ensure that all the DNA evidence was was being collected properly, uh, analyzed properly. Uh, an interesting guy. He's retired now. He's formed a company called Forensic For Real Incorporated. 
My company is Forensic IQ Incorporated. His is Forensic For Real Incorporated. And the intention and the objective of his company is to provide students and law enforcement with training and instruction on forensic evidence collection, crime scene processing. Believe it or not, this man uh, in his company is very similar to mine. And that's good. Uh, that you know, we have people who have spent a number of years uh, developing their skill, developing their knowledge, and now uh, brings that uh, to uh, to uh, the folks that who need it right now, who are doing the business. So, uh, John, I I talked to him last week. Uh, Jim um, uh, Ott is the one that introduced us. Um, great guy, and uh, next week we're going to hear from him and what kind of cases he's doing, and also be very interesting uh, to learn, you know, how you get your arms around all the DNA that um, in all those cases uh, in New York, and how he was able to form this liaison between uh, police um, and the medical examiner's office. Uh, also, want to remind you again: uh, crime scenes in the classroom, the forensic science. Uh, uh, workshop for teachers that's going to be June 25th to 28th uh, on the University of Maryland that uh, I'm sponsoring with uh, the, the School of, uh, College of uh, Education. Uh, we have 24 spots for 24 students. Right now I was told we have close to 18. And we want to fill all those spots. So if you are listening and you are thinking about, and you're a teacher and you're thinking about signing up, you need to do that. Technically the date to sign up was uh, ended this week, but they've extended it because we want to get this full. Uh, and remember, Dr. Um, Richard Safferstein, uh, the famous uh, author of uh, Forensic Science Talk Textbooks, is going to be one of our guest instructors during that week. So hopefully we'll fill that, uh, that uh, class up. You know, it's not till June, and a lot of people, I know, they think it's so, uh, so far away. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting ready to end the show. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Gary Pazillo for uh, being a guest. Gary, you're a good friend, and uh, I appreciate what you do, and uh, you, uh, we really uh, had a good time uh, on the show, and I, I think that uh, uh, our listeners really learned something uh, completely new and out of the box, as you said, so thank you very much. Um, also want to thank my, uh, my intern students, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Fromm, our producer, Mark Lombard, and, and Andrea Williams, who are, are involved in our Forensic IQ Update report. Always remember, ForensicWeek.com is being brought to you through the cooperation with the Hangout10.com live TV show network. We recommend that you go to the Hangout10.com website, learn about other shows like ours that, uh, that have great content and are entertaining and gives you the straight scoop. Remember, ForensicWeek.com um, is uh, real forensic science by real forensic scientists, so on to different subjects also. So, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m., uh, tell your friends, have a safe day and week, and thank you for watching.